tell you about my vision of a production of Mozart's Marriage of Figaro. Now, one of the things that was key when I decided to approach Marriage of Figaro is the idea of Marriage of Figaro as a comedy. It's far too often that we see productions, in my opinion, that tend to stress the seriousness. I feel that it's supposed to be funny. A lot of people will denigrate productions of Marriage of Figaro that emphasize the comedic aspects of the opera. However, they use a term in a way that's negative, but it's actually one of my favorite genres of theater, and that is farce. Now, what is farce? Farce is a style of comedy that has been around since the beginning of theater as we know it. It was practiced in ancient Greece, most notably in the city of Megara, and then has been in existence in various forms in and around Europe specifically for the past several thousand years. Farce is characterized by several specific traits, depending on the time period that you're looking at, but the common denominator between all of them is that farce is theater that is designed to entice laughter. As a result, farce tends to rely on some pretty consistent means to achieve that laughter. First off, farce uses a lot of physical comedy. I can't do a thing with him. You try something. Oh, a wise guy, eh? Ah! Broad or lowbrow comedy. These would be things such as slapstick, <laughs> puns. Well, he said he wanted more, so I gave you some. <laughs> Acrobatics. <laughs> <laughs> And if you're thinking that this sounds vaguely familiar, um, that's because one of the forms of farce that is often talked about is the Commedia dell'arte. Commedia dell'arte, as we know, is a form of Italian street theater that existed in the 15th century, and it's the basis for Mozart's Marriage of Figaro. Most of the characters from Marriage of Figaro are based on Commedia in one way or the other, uh, some more overt than others. Oh. There are a lot of different meanings of farce depending on where you go in the timeline. However, one of the most prominent areas where farce flourished in theater history was in the late Victorian era of England. This would be specifically the last 25 years of the 19th century. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I am glad to say I have never seen a spade. It is obvious that our social spheres have been widely different. Farce was an extremely popular form of theater during this time, and over the course of those 25 years, something like 700 pieces of farce were written. In doing my research for this, I've come across a couple of reference sources that have been particularly helpful for me. For a background on English farce in particular, Leo Hughes' A Century of Farce. Second, in dealing with late Victorian farce in particular, we're looking at Jeffrey Huberman's Late Victorian Farce. What a surprise. And then for a general overview, I've looked at John Caird's theatre craft. So we had this tradition of farce that flourished in England in the last bit of the 19th century, and there are some very specific traits that are common across these plays. I'll just list some of them and see if they sound familiar. Tropes of late Victorian farce. Mistaken identity. Hello! Expedient lies. What's too old? That's a very good question. How old are you? I'm 29. What year were you born? 1977. When did you graduate high school? 94. When did you turn 40? 2017. Junior high crush? Kurt Cameron. Prom theme? Motown Philly, Boys to Men. What movie did you lose your virginity at? Arachnophobia. Theater or drive-in? What's a drive-in? Complications. Anyway, it's a party, and I want the whole family there. We're having a party? No. This could be anything from someone is on one side of a wall and they only hear half of a conversation and then misinterpret it, to someone finds a vaguely worded letter that gives them a different idea than reality. You gave him a letter to mail. Don't tell me that was too much for him. No, Michael. He mailed the letter. That's not the point. Job had not mailed the letter, but in an act of defiance, dramatically hurled the letter into the sea. Things like knockabout. <laughs> Fainting. Collapse like a bunch of broccoli. Oh. Concealment. I'm in the closet like, man, what the f is going on? And then the use of running gags. Inconceivable. You keep using the word. 
I don't think it means what you think it means. And all the other things with the general farce of Commedia. In fact, a lot of the texts that I look at when referencing English farce in particular actually use the term Lazzi, which is the Commedia term for some sort of a physical gag that an actor would need to do in order to portray that he is Arlecchino or something like that. So you may be asking yourself, why farce? Obviously, with each new production, we're going to bring something new to our interpretation of the piece. The most clear thing about farce that works with the Marriage of Figaro is the parallels between the Victorian farce and the plot of Marriage of Figaro are almost identical. Late Victorian farce flourished in a period where there were extreme class distinctions, where we had extremely repressed sexual politics. In particular, the roles that women would play in society were much lower status. In truth, farce as a concept could work in any particular setting. But since we have this rich trove of late Victorian farce, why not go ahead and use it, particularly with the rise of Downton Abbey in the past decade as a really popular television show. Good heavens, what am I sitting on? A uh, swivel chair. Oh. This general timeline is something that people can latch onto as something that they recognize. And that's another reason why I am drawn to this idea of a farce, because I think it's something that people would enjoy. So how does farce work in The Marriage of Figaro specifically. Well, as we talked about earlier, all of the conventions of farce are already embedded into the libretto of The Marriage of Figaro. Characters disguising themselves as one another, fainting, physical fights. We even have a character with a funny voice. And I can't stand him. One of the other really key traits of farce, however, is not just the tropes that exist in the theatrical sense, but the way that it is staged in particular. I'd like to read an excerpt from Theatre Craft by John Caird, where he talks about farce. Caird says, Farce is like comedy on acid. It has to be fast from the very start and must finish fast and furious, but it must be accurate throughout. If you direct farce, you must spend hour upon hour of painfully detailed rehearsal time honing the physical and linguistic routines and rhythms that will eventually release the audience's laughter. Nothing in farce can be left to chance. Now. Fortunately, we have, in addition to the libretto of Marriage of Figaro, Mozart's fantastic score, which is rich with topics and subtext and emotion. So we actually have an entire underscore that would tell us exactly how to go about this. So for example, all of the subtext that we've been discussing in previous presentations, things like the clarinet being the reflection of Susanna's subconscious. <laughs> or the horns being a symbol of cuckolding. We can actually use those to inform the staging of the piece. Now, one of the key things about farce is that it can't just be implied, it has to be overt. So the way that you take this piece and make it something that's comedic throughout, rather than having jokes here and there, is you take the emotion and you turn it up. So when we have a character like Susanna in Act 2 who is appealing to the Count by virtue of his nobility, she would not only be underscored with the idea of this minuet or fandango, as Bellman insists. She would also show that in her physical characterizations. So where before she's a servant girl, all of a sudden she stands with a more extreme posture and the gestures are more ornate and fancy. In that way we communicate that, oh, she thinks that she is above her station. By just cranking up the volume of all the emotions throughout the piece, we take something that is mildly humorous and turn it into something that is over the top and comedic. Give me pity! Give me anger! Fear! By the way, this is not a sin. Comedy in particular is useful because it can shine a light on the absurdities of our lives and our obsessions. In a later excerpt of Theatre Craft, John Caird said, Farces are about human weaknesses cruelly exposed, and we laugh because we can easily imagine ourselves so weak cruel and exposed. Anyone who's watched any political satire knows that just because something is funny, that doesn't necessarily preclude it from having meaning or significance. If someone changed the channel to the Sprout Network, he tweets, Caillou's life is boring even for a cancer kid. Sad. <laughs> Now, naturally, this means that you're going to have to get more commitment from your actors, and you will have to spend more time refining when you slap somebody across the face, or when you faint and nearly fall to the ground and they have to uh, slowly lift you back up again. That's a craft that needs to be worked on in addition to the musical aspects. It might also mean that your beautiful aria, you might overplay that. <laughs> 
Now, this particular staging of Marriage of Figaro, as I said, would be based in England, so we have lots of references for things that we can do to evoke late Victorian interior design and architecture. The design of the Victorian era is sumptuous, while at the same time, the garments are a little bit covered and a little bit repressed. All of this ornateness is something that contrasts with the physical comedy. This first setting of a bedroom is obviously a contemporary Victorian style, but you can see how it would very easily work for both Act 1 and Act 2 of Figaro. We have a bed, we have places for people to sit and write, we have all these curtains and drapes and fabric and rugs, all potential places for characters to hide and interact. If we're looking for a grand ballroom for Act 3, we have a lot of references for these in the Victorian era as well. This, you can see, is some place where we could easily stage a wedding, a ceremony, anything like that. Then, of course, the Victorian era is known for its opulent gardens, which this photo obviously is something that you couldn't reproduce on stage, but you could draw from the idea of a great many flowers or topiaries and hedges. These are things that people can hide behind and again add to a sense of physical comedy. Now in terms of costumes, we have a lot of things that we can do as well. First off, for the Count, he could be dressed in Victorian garb, something like a velvet jacket, which would show his opulence. Also the fact that he's, you know, a little bit smarmy and self-assured. I like the idea of props as well, so this particular picture which has him holding a wine glass is the opportunity for something really, really funny. The Countess, obviously this is not a costume that you would necessarily want to sing into because it's pretty restrictive, but you could see the idea of a bustle which is particularly prominent in the last decade of the 19th century, and then the purple shows a sense of regalness, it's something to base it off of. For Figaro and Susanna, Downton Abbey is actually a little bit too late of a timeline point, but as servants in in an English household, this is something that we could draw on to show the fact that they are servants. So if we look at the maid outfit or the footman's outfit, these would be easy to adapt for the stage. The character of Marcellina is almost too easy. People always seem to want to make her a little bit dowdy, a little bit too serious, and so we would do that here. This larger hoop skirt would be something that would show that she's dressing in the style that's about perhaps two to three decades older. It would show that she's a much more conservative person. And then, of course, you know, when you have someone who's really conservative, who acts in ridiculous ways, and thinks of themselves in a really high status, that's something that's rife for comedy. Bartolo, as a doctor, could be dressed similarly to this. The long coat, I think the mutton chops are definitely a must, because that's how we show a little bit of seriousness, but at the same time, let's be honest, mutton chops are hilarious. When we look at Basilio, I think he would probably wear this cape all the time, like someone who thinks he's extremely important. And maybe underneath this, he's dressed in an older style. This painting called The Gardener by Emil Klaus is obviously Antonio. You can see he's barefoot, he's been working outside all day, whereas for Barbarina we would go with something that's still conservative and Victorian in style, but is not something that would be worn by the upper class. So she has a plain skirt and a separate blouse. I don't even know if she would have a floral pattern in this, but it certainly is a closer look to a peasant than anything else that we would see. Finally, and perhaps most importantly for this particular staging of Marriage of Figaro, I would would want to set it in English. <laughs> Now, this makes sense first off because we're setting it in England. You getting this, Winifred? Oh, yes, dear, every word. But that's not really a compelling reason. In addition, I think that the comedy of the marriage of Figaro really works only if you can actually understand all of the jokes. Parlez-vous le français? Uh. Parlez-vous le français? No. Oh. So if you're going to go with a staging that emphasizes the comedic aspects, we need to have an audience that readily understands what's going on and doesn't have their attention divided between surtitles and what's happening on stage. This isn't to say that surtitles couldn't be useful as an aid, particularly for singers with really bad diction, but we shouldn't be relying on them because it draws focus and the farce is so quick-paced it demands your attention from start to finish. There are a lot of reasons why I'm actually an advocate for singing opera in translation in general 
general. So I'd like to talk about those a little bit because they're particularly relevant for this production. First, there's historical precedent for a lot of operas. If we look at Verdi, if we look at Wagner, if we look at Poulenc, all of these composers in particular expected their audience to hear the opera in the language that they natively spoke. Obviously, this isn't the rule, but it just goes to show that if it's good enough for these composers, it's probably good enough for me. Next, the language barrier is a real problem for people who don't speak it. And if you're doing a production at the Met, which relies on a European audience, people coming in who actually speak Italian or German, then that's well and good. But if we're going to be performing something in Middle America where the majority of the population doesn't speak Italian, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to stage a comedy in Italian because a lot of it's just going to go right over their heads. Now, I'll admit, a lot of people have a gut reaction against singing things in translation, and I'd like to take on some of those arguments right now and just speak to them very briefly. First, people say that composers worked to carefully craft the vocal line and to contour it to the rhythm of the text, but that doesn't mean that it's not possible to take a new text that overlays nicely with the existing melodies. People also tend to say that English in particular is not a musical language and so it doesn't work. That argument I just frankly don't buy. Look at centuries of English song and theater and tell me that it doesn't work. That argument doesn't hold any water for me. A lot of people say, well you can't understand their diction anyway, so what's the point of singing it in English? Don't use your bad diction in order to shut down something that could work for somebody else. Some people also argue that a lot is lost in translation, that the subtleties of the Italian and De Ponte's libretto in particular is lost if you do it in another language. I would actually argue that more is lost by singing it in a language that the audience doesn't understand than singing it in a language they do understand and having a good translation. I know that bad translations exist. Sorry, G. Shermer, the translation by Ruth and Thomas Martin is not very good. However, there is a really nice translation by Jeremy Sams. This is available on the Shandos record label. It's something you can listen to on Naxos Music Database or on Spotify. It's rather than a strict translation, it's more of a translation that exists in the spirit of the libretto. So while the words are not translated literally word for word, you get all of the same subtext and the jokes are present as well. It also is at times affected, which is really humorous, and colloquial, which is also funny. Some people also say that you shouldn't do something in English because, well, you can read the libretto beforehand, or you can read the synopsis and understand what's going on. Not to say that having a deeper understanding of a work is not a worthwhile pursuit, but if we're talking about music that appeals to both lay folk and passionate experts, I, I think it has to appeal to both lay folk and passionate experts, so studying in advance is not something that lay folk are going to do. Finally, the most ridiculous thing that I've heard is that the meaning of the opera is in the music, that the composers crafted the music in such a way that you don't need to understand it. I don't buy that for one second. That's the reason this is opera. That's the reason this is theater. All that said, I would stage this particular production in English. I'm not saying that everyone should, although I would enjoy it much more, and I think it would be more helpful for us as an industry of artists. I don't think that that's the only way to do it. My two cents on that. So, there you have it. Farce. Extremely physical, lowbrow, fast-paced comedy in The Marriage of Figaro. Some people may not like it. I would endeavor to make it something that was so silly and outrageous that you couldn't help but smile. And that would be my interpretation of The Marriage of Figaro. <laughs>
You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.